So React just showed me its taint, and I'm really excited with what I've seen. Yeah, crazy naming, but I think it's important to talk about this. So without further ado, let's get started. Yesterday, I was flying back from TwitchCon, and as soon as I got on the airplane, I saw an article from Sebastian Markbidge from the React and Next.js team all about security in the new server component model in Next. And if you don't already know this, I've been pretty concerned about the security of the new server component model for a bit. And this post helped address a lot of my concerns and also announced some really exciting new primitives to help solve these problems, including the long-awaited Taint. So without further ado, I'd love to show you what has been revealed to me by the Next and React team. Here's the article, How to Think About Security in Next.js. Thank you again, Sebastian, for writing this. I think it's a really important thing for us to discuss. React Server Components, an app router, is a novel paradigm that eliminates much of the redundancy and potential risk linked with conventional methods. Given the newness, developers and subsequently security teams may find it challenging to align their existing security protocols with this model. This document is meant to highlight a few areas to look out for, what protections are built in, and include a guide for auditing applications. We focus especially on the risk of accidental data exposure. This is the important piece. There's a lot of subtle ways that you can accidentally expose data and if you follow the practices of this page, it becomes way less likely that you're going to encounter those problems. I really like how they broke down these three different data models here, where they recommend any of these three methods, either HTTP APIs, data access layer, or when you're in the early prototyping stages, component level data access. I do like that they have made it clear you should pick one of these three approaches and stick with it and not mix and match too much. Obviously, for examples, these component level data access has been really nice, but these other models make much more sense. The HTTP API one is relatively simple, pretty much exactly what you would expect. It's basic recommendations for using existing API endpoints or GraphQL endpoints using fetch to get the data either on the server components or in the client components directly. Doesn't really matter what you use. Server components will allow you to send way less code to the client and prevent a lot of data waterfalls, as they call it here, which helps a lot with performance. So obviously, doing that on the server is great if you can, but it shouldn't feel necessary to do such. This is where things get interesting with the data access layer. The best I can TLDR this is they're effectively recommending you put all of the things that access data, call your database, stuff like that, in a single location, either one object that's exposed from one place or one directory in your code base that is well audited and focused in, such as putting everything in a data directory and making sure everything in there is tagged correctly as server only. So in these examples, they show get current user, which is a cached call, uses the token from your cookie, and then it decodes it, and then it returns the user using this. But if you wanted to get more stuff from the user, such as the permission to see their phone numbers. They use this term DTO a lot in here. They specify below here, data transfer object, which is the object being transferred from the server to the client. And it's important to make sure all DTOs are safe for the client to consume. So in here, get profile DTO gets the current user, which has fields that you probably shouldn't be exposing. So here we actually check each of these fields. Can see username. If so, we return the username and can see phone number. If so, we return the phone number. Otherwise, we do not return those fields. They stay null. This makes it relatively easy to make sure you're only sending the fields you're supposed to. As great as this pattern is, I don't think it's enough. And especially in large code bases, it would be easy for small things to slip through and for a value that maybe shouldn't be exposed to get exposed through these patterns. So how do they recommend handling this? If we scroll down a little bit further, so how do we keep these values from getting exposed incorrectly? Well, there's two pieces. First is the server only package. This basically guarantees that a file will only run on the server. So if you're worried about imports leaking or like accidentally including Prisma when you're just wanting it to be the client bundle, server only guarantees that a file will never be able to import on client and it will throw lots of errors and builds if anything goes wrong there. Really convenient way to make sure that the file itself isn't exposing things to client it shouldn't be. At that point, only the return values are the things to be concerned about. So how do you assure those aren't making it. Well, this is where the taint comes in. Yes, I know it's a crazy term, but Sebastian chose it for a reason. It was supposedly his goal to get us to talk more about security, which clearly worked because here I am recording a video on my off day. So the new taint API is fascinating. It lets you explicitly say this data cannot be passed. So if you take an object, you wrap it with this experimental taint object reference. Now, when you try and pass this to a component, you will get an error. This data is no longer safe to be passed to a component. So here, if we pass the user data, it will fail. If you extract values out of this by hand, such as you grab the name and the phone number from this get user data call and then pass those, you're good. 
This makes it much clearer in code review and in day-to-day -day dev, which things should or shouldn't be passed to the client side. And just to be really clear, if this wasn't a client component, if it was a server component here, it'd be totally cool to pass a tainted value to it. This only matters when the client is the thing receiving the values, because these props are encoded into the elements and into the JavaScript and into the HTML that the user ends up getting on their device. So it's really, really important. You don't pass values here. You don't want to pass. Normally, we would be sure of this by looking at our open API specs, looking at our GraphQL schemas, looking at those types of things. But in models like this, and even in models like TRPC, it's important to go out of your way to make sure the values making it to client are the ones you want to have go to client, not everything that comes out of your database call. This is where things like select star get really scary. And I'm really thankful we have an API like this to help prevent it. This isn't just for the object level reference, though. They actually have a taint unique value call here, where you could say specific keys inside of an object are tainted and need to be careful. So do not pass tokens to a client. So now we'll be sure that the token on this data object does not get passed to the client. And even this does not block derived values. And again, as they specify here, it's better to use a data access layer to access this data and carefully audit that layer to make sure that the things being returned such that they can be passed to a server component are safe always. And one of the patterns I recommend with this is something like TRPC and carefully auditing all of the returns and all of the stuff in your TRPC router so that you're sure the clients are getting things that they're allowed to access and no more or less data than they're supposed to have. I'm happy they touched on SSR versus RSC here. I think it is an important distinction to understand that with RSCs, there's code that only runs on the server. And this code is kind of the default now, which means that you will have values that you probably would never have accessed in Next.js just inside of the code in your React server components. Because not all of the code you run in this new model makes it to the client, you can kind of move that security bar where you want to. You can audit your components carefully and make sure all of those are passing values safely, or you can build the data access layer or you can do things the old HTTP API way. But because of the strength of this new model, we now get to choose how we secure our applications. But we do have to make a choice. And that's kind of the theme of this article. And obviously, everything we've talked about thus far is just about reading values. There's some really good callouts in this section, such as anything accessing your API should probably have a cookies call in it. Because if you just auth at like the top level, like right when a page is accessed, everything else will still be exposed because all of the things you can get on an endpoint are exposed both as an HTML, HTTP access route, as well as a JSON endpoint that is used within Next.js in order to do things like navigate on client side. A couple more important callouts in the read section is that rendering a server component should never perform side effects like mutations. I think this is really important. You should be able to hammer refresh on a page or hit an endpoint with get an infinite number of times. And the worst that happens is you get rate limited. You should never have effects or side effects or anything that changes occur when you're rendering a component. And I think it's a really good call out to point this out, especially since double rendering and patterns like that are still possible even in the server component model. So again, be very careful that you're not running mutations or things that are destructive in your render path. Those should be done under actions, which if I recall, is the next call out here. Right. The idiomatic way to perform writes or mutations in Next.js app router is using server actions. Actions are making a ton of progress. They actually just entered the official experimental React build. So as we see here, server actions have now finally officially entered React Canary, which lets you make an action or a mutation that is scoped to a component level or scoped outside of the component with really, really clean, clear relationships between your forms and the actions themselves. You can also call these async use server functions as just promises on the client side, which is super powerful. It's almost like a mini RPC layer built into React itself. Love this pattern, love what you can do with it. Still making a lot of progress, but we should talk about how to make sure you do it securely because there are some unexpected gotchas. Before we go back to the article, I actually want to demo one of the ones that I was super concerned about when I first saw it that I think we can work around now as a community. First thing we have to do is go turn on server actions. So experimental server actions, true. So now we have server actions on. Let's do a quick, simple demonstration. First thing I want to do is wipe out all the contents of this file because there is way too much junk in here I do not want or need. This is a very minimal example. The one that was in the docs wasn't great, so I made my own. Here, we are getting some secret. Pretend that this is an environment variable we're accessing or some data that is specifically private to us that we want on our server, but we don't want to expose to the users. Everything we're returning here is either a server component or just JSX. So where would there be a security issue here? Doesn't seem immediately like there would be any problems, right? 
Well, I'm going to show you the thing that is scary about this particular pattern in this particular model. Fun run dev. And now I go to localhost. We have our publish button. And when I click this, we look at the terminal, we'll see secret is secret 420. Cool. So that code runs when we click the button, it runs on the server. So again, what's the issue? Well, if we take a look at the data that has been encoded here, in fact, I'm actually going to search for secret. What's that? Why is that in there? Well, if you see the form that we created, we actually have a couple hidden fields that are automatically put into the HTML. The reason that these fields exist and the reason all of this junk, so to speak, has made it into the HTML that we created is that React and Next.js are using this to identify which action to run and what context is needed for that action to run correctly. Because in that component, we are creating this value. It is in the scope of the component. And we need to make sure that this value is still there when this function runs. And there's no guarantee if we rerun the component, that the value that was here will still be the one inside of this. So next needs a way to have all of the context that this function needs inside of it. There is one hack, or I guess there's a couple ways we can get around this. The first easy and obvious one is move the async call here. Now that this value is enclosed within the server action, instead of being defined outside of it, you will no longer have to worry about it leaking into the form. And if I refresh, we go back to this form, you'll see all we have here is the hidden action ID, which is again used just for Next.js to identify which action should run in the case that we have something like three actions on the same page. So now this is totally safe. Let's go back to the article so we can see much more about what is and isn't recommended with this model. One important detail, though, is with the next 14 release, these enclosed variables will actually be encrypted with the action ID so that you won't be able to decrypt them on the client side. So instead of that exact value being leaked over, there will just be an encrypted hash there instead. This should prevent the majority of the issues possible with this model from happening, but it is still something we need to look out for. And ideally, you won't have these values being enclosed in this way. One additional interesting thing is to get back this old behavior without the encryption, you can actually bind values to your action directly like this, where we want delete post to have this ID defined when the function runs, and we can actually bind it by calling delete post.bind null comma post.id. This is a really interesting new pattern. I'm excited to see how people use this to make powerful APIs that let you do things like inline deletions without any JavaScript running on the client. There's really, really cool opportunities with this pattern. This pattern is really exciting and I can't wait to see what people do with this, even for stuff that we're doing with upload thing. I see a lot of potential with these patterns for binding values to actions to give users access to the right data in line all the time. If you're not already familiar, CSRF is cross-site request forgery. It's a method used to access data on other websites by stealing cookies from the one you're on and forging requests to access things you probably shouldn't. Because everything in the new model is on the same correct host, it's much harder for CSRF attacks to be viable. As they specify here, server actions are always implemented using post and only this HTTP method is allowed to invoke them. This alone prevents most CSRF vulnerabilities in modern browsers, particularly due to same site cookies being the default. What this means is you can't get this endpoint, so you can't expose the cookies through stuff like iframes and other insecure methods that would allow somebody to click a link, hit an endpoint they're not supposed to with a cookie that they still have, and now that attacker can access that data. I'm not good enough with security to be the right person to break this down. It's somewhat common for people to use forwarders rewrites and lots of other patterns to access data they're probably not supposed to by abusing cookies and by checking origin and host and doing all these things, especially enforcing post as the method for all actions, you're able to prevent a lot of these types of attacks. That all said, HTML sanitization is crucial because if somebody renders HTML they shouldn't be able to inside of your app, they can still have a lot of these types of issues. So again, you got to be real careful with how things are being rendered in your app, but as long as you're not dangerously setting in your HTML or rendering HTML straight from database or user-defined values, you'll be safe more often than not. And one last call out here I think is important. If you're using custom route handlers, as in you're defining your own posts, puts, gets, deletes in your next app, those will still need to be audited more carefully as those are defining traditional endpoints and none of the built-in protections are going to protect you there. One more thing I hadn't even thought about was error messages and the possibility of them exposing values that they shouldn't. The way that they've handled this in the new next model is in production, the server sends hashed IDs to the client for what error occurred. And then the server keeps track of those errors so you can check those in your logs and still have everything you need for something like Sentry or Highlight to work as expected when debugging. It's important to not accidentally leak like a credit card number in an error. And I've 
built things like this even back when I worked at Amazon to make sure we weren't leaking data that we weren't supposed to. It's really nice to have this built in as the default production workflow. One last cool call they made is what to look for if you're a security researcher or developer that is focused on security. They call it a bunch of important things like using validation, make sure ser use server files are taking arguments correctly and are accessing and posting data that they're supposed to, that use client components aren't taking props that are insecure, stuff like that. I love this article. I think it's really going to help us take a step in the right direction with security with this new model. Most React developers haven't thought much about security because that's been the API team's problem. And I've seen all sorts of chaos from storing tokens in local storage to just returning weird data in the HTML directly so the client can have access. A lot of these patterns are much less important in the new model, but we also now as front-end developers have to think a little bit more about how we're getting our data and is it secure or not. As the entire industry moves towards the full stack direction, it's more and more important than ever that we think about security with every change we make. Thank you to Sebastian for writing this article. I'm really excited about the future of this new model. If you want to hear more about the benefits of using server components and what makes them so fun and enjoyable to work with, I'll put a video here where I break them down in depth. If you've already seen that or you're not interested, there's a video right below it that YouTube seems to think you're going to like. Thank you guys as always. Appreciate you a ton. Peace, nerds.